Yes, of course. Okay, very good. All right, everyone. Uh, I just, uh, my name is Jason Atkinson. I'm uh, from Running Springs. It's nice and cool. It's about 68 degrees up here right now, so it's wonderful. But uh, I'm going to get started. Clearly, you can see I'm uh, presenting to you really from the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And obviously, you know, that's uh, just a trick of technology and, and a green screen. But it does kind of show the point that technology really can take you just about anywhere in the world. And uh, that's part of what this presentation is about. So I'm going to share my screen and get started. Okay, so I'm going to talk a bit about virtual field trips. Um, it's uh, an amazing, amazing thing that we can do that 10, 15 years ago, we really couldn't. So it's a, it's a beautiful thing. I'm going to start out with a, sh a video. It's about five minutes, which seems a bit long, but it really is pretty incredible and uh, gives you a, a sense of the wonder that we can instill in students. None of them have any sense of a world beneath the ocean. I use technology in the classroom so that I can reach beyond the walls. Uh, you know, we look for those moments where the kids have their eyes wide open and you get those big smiles on their face when something finally clicks. It's really been a unique opportunity for my students to experience uh, something other than Serbia. Today we are going to have a chat with Fabian Cousteau, who is at the bottom of the sea in the one and only uh, underwater lab uh, called Aquarius. He is going to be uh, on Skype with us live, so you'll get a chance to talk to him. <laughs> Fantastic. Welcome to the bottom of the sea in the world's only undersea marine laboratory, Aquarius. We're 63 feet down from the surface. Uh, we're uh, nine miles offshore of the Florida Keys in the Atlantic. Aquarius is unique because it's the world's only undersea marine laboratory left in the world. We're basically basing Mission 31 off of something my grandfather did 50 years ago for the first time on a Cousteau expedition. Uh, we have live cameras inside and outside the habitat. We are uh, tuned into your camera. Hi. Hello. Hi. There's a stingray. That's really neat. And there are some groupers. Look at that tarpon. So there you go, you get a little taste of uh, what it's like to live and work underwater. The kids were just amazed at how easy it was and you know they saw that format as well as being able to connect easily and communicate with someone whether they were 6,000 miles away or 200 miles away. Hi, I'm Chase and is it easy to fall asleep underwater? <laughs> I can show you, if you like, what it looks like to sleep in the sea. So here we go. And you can see right here is our sleeping quarters. And at night, we have the best television in the world. I think the most memorable moment of calling Mission 31 today was seeing my students' faces when they looked out of the window. Could you describe the way you come and go out of the lab without the water rushing in? Because the air pressure inside the habitat is the same as the water pressure outside the habitat, water does not come rushing into this habitat. You can 
make them feel like they're connected to a world that as children they might not feel connected to in the first place. Have you found anything that can make medicine or could cure a disease? There's so much left to be discovered out there with regard to cures for different ailments. We've only explored less than 5% of our ocean. So there's a lot left out there. And, um, and I really, uh, I, I do believe that this is our natural resource bank account. And uh, we need to look into it as far as those kinds of treatments and cures. Thank you it for is. this opportunity to visit your uh, uh, lab. It was amazing because uh, I spoke with someone who is under the sea. Mine was when they had a view from the scuba divers, so you get to see what they see. Yeah, well, it would be pretty cool if we did that kind of learning every day because it's a different take to subjects. Bye! Bye-bye. So there were some amazing things in that that hopefully you saw, just the sense of wonder in the kids' eyes, but the ability to go almost anywhere in the world. Uh, there's a quote that's from St. Augustine, but it's not really from him. It was misappropriate, mis, mis quote, uh, misattributed to him. It says, the world is a book, and those who do not travel read only one page. And so many of our students don't see as much of the outside world as, as would seem a good idea. Um, I worked for 19 years at uh, one of the lowest socioeconomic schools in our district, and in, we were on the opposite side from downtown Riverside in Harupa, and most of my kids didn't even realize there were multi-story buildings in downtown Riverside. And it was a distance of maybe eight miles, less than that. So the ability to help our students see what's outside of the realm of what they're used to has so many benefits for them and for our society at large. So why are digital and virtual field trips a good idea? So even before COVID came about, we can take our curriculum and make it real to the students. It's on a page, great. We do things to bring in realia, do things to try and make it more real to the students in the classroom. But can you imagine when you add in more than just a video or just a picture from technology, which are great in and of themselves and definitely a step up from the textbook, but to have some, someone outside of, of their sphere that they can interact with, ask questions uh, of and to get answers from. Um, also, we aren't experts on everything in the world. You know, at some point we've realized that we aren't the, the holder of all information. We need to relinquish that, all the information's out there on the internet. Why not bring in the experts that know exactly what it is that we're working on very specifically and are experts at that particular topic. Another wonderful thing is the ability to connect with others, whether it's other students, other grown-ups, like we said, um, and, as students see other people and notice their, their life situation and how things are going in their world, we can develop and expand that empathy. And we all know that that's a, that's a quality that humans are slowly losing and we need to develop that empathy for, for the greater good of the world, for sure. Um, and then of course now our students for several months have been uh, increasingly isolated and uh, that social benefit, even if it's just interacting with another class on the other side of the planet in something academic, is still, uh, is still helping them connect with other people. Okay, um, this is just a short minute and a half video that I made a couple of years ago at my old school. Nancy, could you play that, please?
No, there isn't any sound in this. Thank you, Nancy. So you really can go anywhere in the world. If you saw the, the little bit, there were some penguins there and we uh, reached out to a penguin researcher in Antarctica. And it took us two years. The first year uh, they had a windstorm that threatened uh, the tent, the outer layer of the tent had ripped. And if the inner layer had had ripped too, they were going to pack up what they could and go to an emergency evacuation center. And the students got to hear that firsthand. Uh, but the second year we connected with them and it was absolutely amazing. They were out there at the penguin colony with an iPad that was wrapped up with heat with hand warmers to keep the battery warm. And even then they were having problems. But it was amazing because the lady would sit and talk with us. And then when she wanted to illustrate something that she had just mentioned, she'd flip the iPad around and point to the penguins so the students could see what it was she was talking about. And that's just not an experience that you're gonna get anywhere else. So technology really has, has, has changed everything in this regard. Um, and as you can see, we kept track of our miles and that was a wonderful math component to it. Uh, my principal at the time was in the room after we finished one and I said, okay, guys, uh, look up how many miles we have so far and add in this year, this uh, day's miles. The students hopped on Google Maps, typed in where we were, typed in where we had just connected with, figured out how many miles it was, added it to the last one. And the principal kind of was amazed that second graders were able to add four and five digit numbers without any real problem. And the key was that they were motivated to do it. So that was pretty neat. Okay, so basically there's two ways to do uh, a field trip. One is a self-contained, you've already made it. And you can think of that. There's some virtual tours of museums that are web-based. You could do it on a set of PowerPoint slides and I'll show you a template for that in a few minutes and then also a set of Google Slides. So you can start with you know, the entrance of, let's say it's a museum, and going to the next spot and the next spot, the next spot. Um, the, other, the other side of the coin is a live, uh, a live field trip. And that would be something like where we talk to the penguin researcher or where in the video you saw um, the students in Serbia and the United Kingdom can, and actually one in uh, North Carolina connecting with Aquarius Habitat. We did that one too, and that was pretty neat. Um, some places to look for ideas are Skype in the classroom. Uh, there's Skype an author or scientist. There's California Ports Program, which I've done a lot with, and they're pretty amazing. And also, of course, the National Park, Parks Program as well. Um, and I know these say Skype, but almost everyone has been uh, totally willing to adjust their platform, whether it was Skype, uh, Google Meets, Zoom, whatever you have that works that, that they will almost always adapt to. So, And then the last one I was going to mention is Mystery Skype. That one would be a bit tricky if you're doing distance learning like most of us will be starting in uh, next month or September. But Mystery Skype essentially is where one class calls another class somewhere across the country or could be anywhere in the world. And they ask yes or no questions to try and clue in on where that other class is. Um, they take turns. It's really uh, an engaging, but also uh, an activity that has a lot of uh, critical thinking. So that's 
Uh, wonderful. But it would be a bit tough to do right now. Um, let's talk a little bit about technology again. So we're just talking about the different platforms. Some things that you'll need to think about before you get started are um, the, like I said, most groups are fine with different platforms, but you'll need to look at your district's student permissions on whatever video conferencing you're using. Our district uh, uses Zoom or Google Meets, um, but our students' Google Meets accounts are only good within our district uh, domain. So let's say I was contacting a, a museum in New York and they were gonna, they said, okay, sure, we'll do Google Meets with you. The problem would be if they're the ones that uh, begin the meet, it's, you know, it's their meeting, then my students won't be able to connect. So in that case, what I would do is I would be the one to create the link. That way my students can connect into it from home. And then the museum can also use that link because usually teacher accounts have different permissions and student accounts. Um, if you run into trouble with that, then something to talk with your technology coordinator at your site or your district with, but usually it's pretty easy to get everything worked out. And again, uh, some, some platforms will need permissions for the host. So for instance, right now, Nancy Delgado, thank you again, has, is the host as well as I am, so we can both share our screens. So you would wanna do the same for the museum or whoever you're talking with and yourself. Some, some important things though, is you want to pre-teach the, the material a little bit so that kids already have some idea what they're doing and they'll be more engaged. The other thing is if you noticed in that Aquarius under C lab video is that the students were clearly uh, reading questions that they had already uh, written down beforehand. I found this out the hard way. We were doing, uh, we've done three lessons on the uh, characteristics of mammals. And, at the, and then we had our, our video conference and the, the lady asked, the park ranger said, do you have any questions? One of my students raised his hand. He was so excited and he got up there and went, um, uh, why are bears mammals? And the whole class groaned because it was, that was one of the example animals she used to tell us about the characteristics of mammals. The student later redeemed himself when we did one about butterflies and he asked, how many lenses does the eye of a butterfly have? So that was pretty neat. Uh, the last one I'm gonna talk about for technology is that in, uh, if we, well, not if, when we eventually get back to in-class learning, sometimes if you've got your whole class spread out around the room, which seems very likely, uh, sometimes the microphone on your computer won't pick up students' questions. So I would typically have one student in the front that would be the spokesperson. Uh, the student would, would ask their question and the spokesperson would say it again into the microphone. So that, those are some things to think about with the live video conferences. Uh, if you're gonna do a self-contained tour of somewhere, uh, do you wanna go through it as a class? all at the same time, you sharing your screen with them? Or do you want to perhaps give it the link out to students and let them explore it on their own? And certainly you could combine the two by letting them explore first and then later go through it as a class and have discussion as it's going. Okay, and then the other thing is to uh, consider is what do you want as a result of either of these types of video conferences? Uh, to have a great experience is wonderful, but then let's synthesize their thinking, whether that be notes, whether that be questions that you have posed to them beforehand that you want them to search out the answers for during the conference. Uh, another thing I've had students do is they're the ones that are supposed to generate questions about the conference, and that works quite well also. Okay. Um, so for, I'm gonna start a little bit with the self-contained. So you can see that there's pre-made ones. If you uh, Google a certain museum or, uh, or a, a state park, frequently they'll have a virtual tour. That's already pre-made, ready to go. You just share the link or share your screen. And then you can have, you can make ones, obviously. Uh, 
by pulling up Google image, uh, images from wherever, of course you want to cite them. Um, here's a PowerPoint template that's very fancy. Um, and it basically lays out what to put where. You can make it as fancy as you want. You can also have assign that for students to make, right? A student made a uh, field trip would be pretty great. Them choosing where what they're interested in, and then they can obviously share them to other students. And then another thing you can do is with Google Slides, and I made a very, very basic template that you can pull and make a copy of. And it, like I said, very basic. On the second slide, I just made little boxes that are links to other slides that you would then fill in information later. Right? So you could take a map and let's just go background and choose image. And then we'll do a Google search. We'll go a map of a museum. And let's just take this one then. We'll insert it as the background. And what do you know? Oh, look at that. They all line up. That's amazing. So the way this would be set is then your students can choose to go where they're interested in. Maybe they're really interested in the instrument room. So that's three. So they go location three. And when they click there, it's going to take them to that location three and you fill in whatever information you want, whether it's pictures or that sort of thing. Um, and I'm just gonna share a quick Google tip. Most of you probably already know, but if not, it's new to you, right? Um, when you're sharing and you pull that link, if you, Not that link. If you look and find where it says edit, of course you can put in copy, but that makes someone else uh, make a copy. But if you type in present instead of edit, when they pull that link, it will automatically go into present mode. So that's that same slideshow. Quick Google tip that I'm sure you probably already know about. All right. So again, with, with this template, either you can spend some time to make a wonderful field trip for your students anywhere that you can pull information and pictures from. Or again, you can you can send your kids down that rabbit hole of where do they want to go? Where what do they want to tell other people? And then as far as a uh, lot sort of live, I've listed a bunch of, of places to get started. Here's the Skype in the classroom, the California Parks uh, Ports program. And I'm just gonna sp spend a quick couple of seconds on that because it's pretty amazing what they've done. And National Parks is the same, and I would, I would suspect, but don't know, the other states' park programs are probably done similar. So if we scroll down, Almost most of the state parks have interactive uh, lessons that they'll do with with students that in the springtime as everything went down the tubes real quickly they turned to becoming just more webinars to try and engage a greater audience at once. <clears throat> but the way it usually works is they'll send you a couple of lessons to do with your class and then after you've done the lessons you have a video conference with them. And they're really engaging. They get the kids up and out of their chairs and moving around. We did butterflies, the life cycle of butterflies, and we had the kids pantomiming all the different uh, activities that butterflies do. And you can see different different places around the state. First Castle is uh, deals all, you'd think originally you'd think art history, but it does a lot with uh, Roman architecture. So it's kind of interesting. 
um, all kinds of great places. And of all the ones I've done, they've all been really wonderful. The kids have loved them. They've learned a lot from them, both from the well done lessons that they provide and from the, the uh, video conference. So it's pretty, pretty neat stuff. So I highly recommend uh, the ports program. Uh, and then these are just some some spots. Good Housekeeping had an article with a bunch of different uh, trips, whether they're field trips or tours. And so any of these will keep you busy for quite a while. And then this is just a link to a Google search of field trips or virtual tours. So really quite amazing stuff. Uh, let's go to some numbers. So, I mean, you can read these, but I'll read them. Uh, this was a 2018 poll of adults that says that 11% had never left their home state. 13% had never been in an airplane. 40% had never visited another country. 54% visited 10 or fewer United States. And then the flip side is 75, 76% would like to travel more than they do. Whether it's time, finances, whatever the case is, these virtual field trips, while not the same as going to Italy, is a good uh, improvement over just looking at some pictures in a, in a textbook. So a quick summary is that these virtual field trips can enhance your curriculum, bring in outside experts that know that, that your students can ask questions of that you or I are not going to know the answer to because we can't be experts at everything. It can connect your kids to the world. And in this day and age of isolation and our loss of empathy is huge. Um, we've, my class has done Skypes or video conferences with different classes all over the world. One was in India, which was really eye opening. They had uh, built a school garden. And then they were share, their, their students were sharing it with other classes around the world. It, it inspired my kids to want to do the same. And it can certainly whet their appetite to explore the world as it is now and when they're, when they're older. So uh, there's just so many different possibilities. The technology part can seem daunting at first, but it doesn't take much time. You're already on Zoom connected in today. Video conferences are not, not any harder. So I've been quick, I spoke a little fast, but I wanted to give you a bit of time to look through those resources. Um, and then if you have any questions, I'm, I'm quite willing to answer anything that I can. Um, so maybe with questions, maybe the chat would be the best place and I'll try and answer those. And again, I wanted to thank Nancy for her help with uh, the technology aspect of hosting it. So I'll stop sharing my screen now. And if anyone has any questions, I will try and answer those. Ah, yes, I'll, I'll show the, the resource slide in just a second. Um, and then also you can get to those slides at the bottom of the session description in Zoom. And then you have all those resources. Jason, this is Steve. I, I see that there's in the chat a question, can you recommend how to use Google Maps more and connecting that with field trips? Very good. That's a great question that no, I can't. <laughs> um, I used Google Maps in that every time, no, granted, I have second graders, little ones, that when we, we Skyped or Google Meeted or Zoomed with a different class or a different museum or a different place, we would uh, we would pin it, and then the kids calculated per, uh, mileage. Now there are other people that are doing sort of virtual field trips that are built in Google Earth, and it uses stuff that's already built in with Google Earth. So if you said the pyramids of Giza, it'll take you there. There's plenty of pictures. There's plenty of Wikipedia articles that connect with that. Um, and I did look up a, a few of them yesterday, but the thing to do is just Google uh, virtual field trip with Google Earth. And there was tutorials and everything. 
I haven't done it with my little kids yet, so no, I'm not going to uh, be able to tell you much about that. Sorry. Um, someone said, what museums have you had success with? Virtually, virtually, there's that word. <laughs> Almost every museum right now has some sort of virtual connection, whether it's just a tour that's sort of pre-planned, pre-programmed, it's like a video, or it's an interactive, but most have some sort of uh, outreach to the community, especially right now with COVID. So, I, I, go ahead, Steve. I, I was gonna say, I saw another one here with, uh, if you had any suggestions for preschoolers or TK and the real little, so what kind of um, uh, field trips might be helpful in those cases? Right, right. Um, so a neat one is, again, the California Ports Program. They've been doing it enough so that they can gear it to almost everything. Um, we had ones that were, were uh, aimed at, say, fifth or sixth grade, and I've said, hey, we'd, my second graders would be really interested in this. And they said, no problem, we can adapt it. So they can adapt up or down to fit. So I think you're going to find that most will. Another great one for the very littles would be uh, the Skype and author. So they have uh, books that the author's written and sort of an age range. And then you, I would buy the book to support the author, read it to my students, and then the, we'd connect with the author. Sometimes they would read one of their other books to us or talk about how they wrote that book or what they were thinking as they wrote it. So. There's uh, lots, really, to be honest with you. That's great. I wondered, uh, this is a question from me, actually. I wondered if you had any experience using Google Expeditions. I, having not been in the classroom in a long time, uh, I, I have, was pretty excited when I saw it, and I played with it with my grandchildren, and they really got a lot out of it. Yeah, I, it does look pretty amazing, but no, I haven't used that. Uh, let's see, someone said, who do you reach out to at the museums? I think mostly the place to start would be start at the website. And yeah, as someone just, as Corinne just wrote, look for an educator link. But most of them at this, at this time in, in life have something on the front page about Corona, about the COVID and, and uh, virtual tours. I, my dad was a, a, a chemist at UCR and I once did one with him and, you know, just the, the simplest, what seemed simplest was uh, experiments with liquid nitrogen, which we know is very cold, right? And so, you know, they'd put a beaker and put a balloon on top and the, the, the cold would shrink the balloon and then explaining that sort of science to kids. So, you, you know, it doesn't even have to be an official Skype expert. You can reach out to friends that you know and that sort of thing. Let's see. I'll put up the slide resource, but honestly, the best way is to go through the skin and get the slides. And then that way you can, uh, you have those all ready to go. They're all clickable links. Um, someone said, can you show us where to type present in the URL again? So when you get the share link, post it somewhere, whether it's the URL board or in an email or the assignment you're going to push out to students. And towards the end, it says edit. Just uh, take out the word edit and put in present. Preschool, let's see. Right, college campus trips would be great, yeah. So there's so much going on with virtual field trips right now that, that if you just Google virtual field trips, you'll get more information than you're going to be able to get through in weeks. So it's more a matter of uh, getting through and narrowing it down to something that you're focused on. The first time I did this, I got a little too spread out. I was taking field trips left, right, and center that some of them didn't apply as much to what we we're doing. They were just cool experiences. And I honestly did see my students getting burned out a little bit if it didn't have a connection to something we were doing in class. So that's one 
one thing just as a warning. Um, I'm pretty much there. If there's anything else I can do, please let me know. Email's right there and Twitter's there. But other than that, please feel to jump onto the, onto the resources and have a look around. And I hope you have a great rest of today and a great rest of uh, the conference. Thank Jason, you. just speaking for everyone, this is a great uh, session that you did today. and I really enjoyed uh, participating. Thank you. Well, thank you, sir. And thank you everyone for coming.